This is the view from the Tokyo Metropolitan Building, which you can visit for free to get a view of Shinjuku. It's not the highest place that you can find in Tokyo, but it offers a look down on some neighboring buildings. So I took the opportunity to take some photographs there for this tutorial. You can download these photos along with the written version of this tutorial in my ebook. The link for that is in the description. I also want to mention that you can get a 20 euro discount if you get both my book and my video course as a bundle. Let's turn this photo into a mysterious post-apocalyptic world. For this we'll use FSpy, which is both a standalone free app and a free Blender add-on. You'll need the app to create the FSpy files and the add-on to import them in Blender. I have noticed from the comments on older tutorials about this topic that a lot of people download the wrong version of FSpy and therefore think that it no longer works. So make sure you use the links in the description of this video for the correct versions. To get started, download the FSpy setup file. Click on it to install it. This is the standalone FSpy app. You'll also need to download the Blender FSpy add-on, version 1.0.3. In Blender, go to Preferences and install the add-on. Click on Install and select the downloaded zip file. And then enable it. Drag and drop a photograph into the standalone FSpy app. We can enable a 3D guide in the shape of a cube. You can move this cube around to check if the perspective lines up with the photo. In the beginning it doesn't, so we'll have to adjust vanishing points. I would like to have the axis in FSpy point in the same direction as they do in Blender. That way we won't end up with some weirdly oriented upside down scene. You can see the axis for reference in the navigation gizmo in Blender. I'll quickly draw some annotations to show you the positive and negative axes. To make the axes in FSpy correspond to those in Blender, we'll need to change the vanishing point axes. Like this. As you can see, now they match those in Blender. Now we can start aligning the vanishing points by dragging their endpoints. By holding Shift, you can zoom in to more precisely place them. In this case, I'm using this building as reference. We can test if the perspective of the 3 d CAD cube matches the buildings. It seems to be almost there. I think we can improve it by using a building that is further away as the reference for this vanishing point. Now it seems to align even better. The next step is to save this file. This file can then be imported in Blender. Let me just remove this annotation. And because we installed the FSpy add-on, we now have an FSpy import option. I'll choose the file I just saved from the standalone app. This file contains the photograph as well as a camera. And as you can see from the camera view, the cube aligns to the perspective of the photo. It's a good idea to save the blend file at this point. We still have the original camera from the default Blender scene, which we don't need. So select that one and just delete it. As you can see, the imported camera has the name of the FSpy project. I'll turn on X-ray mode so I can see the buildings in the photograph through the mesh. In edit mode, I'll delete this bottom face as it won't be visible anyway. Now it's just a matter of moving vertices to match the buildings in the photo. To move things along just one axis, press for example G and Z to move it along the Z axis, G and Y to move it along the Y axis, or G and X to move it along the X axis. By holding Alt and clicking, we can select all these bottom edges and move them down. This is the very basic shape of this building, and from here it's just a matter of adding more detail. But first, let's select all and duplicate with Shift D for the next building. By pressing G to move and then Shift Z, we exclude the Z axis so we can move it easily without accidentally moving up or down. And then it's just a matter of adjusting the shape for that particular building. Press R and Z to rotate along the Z axis, like for this building here. 
If you press G twice, select an edge to slide along, it will turn yellow, and then press C, you can slide outwards along that edge. This can be convenient if you've rotated something and need to move along its local orientation. So just press G twice, choose the edge to slide along so it turns yellow, then press C to be able to slide away from the geometry. To create these gaps in the side of the building, I'll select and duplicate this face. Then scale it along the x-axis. And move it over here. Then extrude along the y-axis with E and Y. I'll just move it slightly so there are no faces overlapping in the exact same location. Let me just check the face orientation. Yep, they are flipped. Pressing Shift N recalculates the normals so that they are no longer flipped. I'm planning to use this to do a boolean cut and flipped faces can cause trouble with boolean cutting. Now, with this extruded face selected, go to Face Intersect Boolean. This cuts a nice chunk out of the building. We can repeat the same steps on this side. The benefit of duplicating a face for this purpose is that the face is already perfectly aligned with the side that we want to cut out of. In this case, it seems that the boolean cut didn't work. If that happens, you can try a different solver method or checking these boxes. Checking self-intersection solved the problem in this case. Some minor adjustments are necessary. Next, let's do the corners of this building. Hold Shift and select them all. Press Ctrl B to bevel and then scroll the mouse wheel up to add one segment. Changing the shape to zero gives us the shape we need. We can fine tune it if necessary. I won't explain the rest of the modeling step by step as it's mostly very basic and repetitive stuff. Just lots of extruding, adding more loops where needed, moving faces and beveling here and there to add some rounded parts. Honestly, a lot of these things are just simple cubes. You can get away with a lot when using production mapping like this, because the texture has so much information. After some more basic modeling, we have a bunch of simple buildings. Next, we need to add a material. I'll open a shader editor for that. Select the principal BSDF and press Ctrl T to add the necessary nodes. The photo is already loaded with the fspy file, so we can choose it as the texture. Select all in edit mode, press U and choose project from view. And switch to material preview to see the result. It kinda worked, but as you can see it's all wobbly and distorted. We can make this better by subdividing a bunch of times, although in this case that adds a lot of unnecessary geometry. So let's not do that. I'll just move everything to the center of the world. This is not strictly necessary, but I just feel weird having everything in a strange location. Let's add a grid. And increase its resolution to 100 by 100. Rotate and scale it so that it encompasses the buildings. And move it so it's not overlapping or inside of them. Go to Front Orthographic View. In edit mode, press A to select all and press X, then choose only faces. Now we just have a grid of edges. I'll just quickly rename this to buildings to keep things organized. Now with the buildings selected, go to edit mode. Hold Ctrl and in the outliner, select the grid. Go to mesh knife project. And then make sure cut through is enabled. Now the buildings are sliced, giving them all enough geometry so that the texture is not distorted. We can hide or just delete the grid. Now if we carefully move the camera, you'll see that we get this subtle camera move. If you want, you can increase the passepartout value so you don't see what's outside of the camera frame. And we can add an empty to use as the depth of field target. To get some unrealistic but nice looking shallow depth of field. What we can do is add a plane and add the background texture to it. To make sure it's always facing the camera, add a track to constraint to it. Then choose the camera as the target. 
Move the plane behind the buildings and scale it up as necessary to fill the frame. Add some edge loops so that the texture won't be distorted. And just like with the buildings in the foreground, select all, press U and choose project from view. You can use the same material as for the buildings. We can disable the background image now as we no longer need it for reference. Now the far background is also affected by the camera's depth of field. And we can move the empty to change the focus point. Now I'd like to add some volumetric haze to make it look more interesting. To do that I just add a cube around the scene. And for ease of use I'll set it to bounce in the viewport display. Give it a material with an appropriate name. Remove the principled BSDF and add a volume scatter node instead. Connect it to the volume input of the material. The density value controls how thick the haze is. I'll add an HDRI using the Gaffer add-on. Of course, all this will look much better in cycles. And it will be faster if I use my GPU and enable denoise. Using the Gaffer add-on, it's easy to test different HDRIs to find a good look. If necessary, we can always adjust the position of the buildings. To control the look of the haze, we can use the anisotropy value as well. However, you can also just move the volume cube. If you place the cube just before the camera like this, the buildings nearest to the camera will have a bit more contrast. Let's add a timeline so we can animate in the camera. Select the camera and add a keyframe at frame 1. Set the key to linear interpolation so the movement is linear instead of easing in. I'll change the resolution to a more standard 4K format. And then we can go to a later frame and move the camera to a new position. By holding shift it's easier to make a subtle change in the location of the camera. I'll also move it down a bit. And then I'll set a keyframe. So now we have this small movement. And I'll set that second key to linear as well. If this was shot from a helicopter for example, the movement would be linear in real life as well. Let's calculate how many frames we need. I want 5 seconds of animation with 24 frames per second, so that's 120 frames. I'll move this key to frame 120 and set the end to 120 as well. To do a test render, I'll limit the render time to 1 second per frame and set the resolution to 25%. As this will render pretty fast, I'll choose an H264 video for the test. Then press Ctrl F12 or choose Render Animation. As you can see, at this low res and with only 1 second as the render limit, it goes pretty fast. And this is the result of the low quality test render. I recommend always rendering a low quality quick render before you commit to rendering slow high quality frames. I'm actually not really happy with this animation as it's not really showing off the 3D nature of the scene. So I'll adjust this second keyframe to make it a bit more interesting. This camera move is better. Ok, let's set the resolution back to 4K and open EXR for the file format. Now we'll render an image sequence. 16-bit or half float is enough. I just check that it's set to AGX, which will give us a nice linear image for later color grading. And I'll also increase the render time of course. Let's calculate how long it'll take, more or less. 120 frames times 10 seconds divided by 60 seconds gives us 20 minutes of render time. 30 seconds per frame will take an hour. That seems fine to me. Before rendering, let's save just in case. And to make it easier for the computer, I'll set the viewport to solid mode. Actually, before I render, I want to make the scene a bit more mysterious. I think it could be interesting if one of these windows had a light inside, as if that's like the last person in the whole world living there. I'll need to add a couple more edge loops. If you press G twice, you can slide edges without distorting the texture. I'll add a second material to the window. Assign it to the selected face and give it a name. 
remove the principal PSDF and put an emission shader in its place. We can manually give it a color. But to be more realistic, we can add a black body node to use a real life color temperature value. Something like 2200 Kelvin gives us a nice warm artificial light color. You can just Google these more commonly used black body values. It looks like 3400 Kelvin would be more appropriate. I'd like the light to stand out more and we can try to increase the strength or we can experiment with the lighting so the window is in the shaded side of the building which makes it stand out more. The Gather app lets you rotate the HDRI easily. This HDRI is from Polyhaven by the way. We can make it even darker and more dramatic by increasing the density of the volume. I wouldn't want to live in this post-apocalyptic city. In reality, this part of Tokyo is a lot of fun and not post-apocalyptic at all. We can also reduce the brightness of the HDRI. This looks quite interesting and mysterious. Let's save it and render it in 4K. And here is the result of the render. And here it is after color grading it in DaVinci Resolve. Thank you very much for watching patiently all the way to the end, and I hope it was an interesting video for you. See you next time!